Friends, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Esther. The book of Esther, we're on the last chapter of the book of Esther. So last sermon, last message on that, 716 is the page number. That's Esther chapter 10. Esther chapter 10. And we'll read those three verses there to close out the book of Esther. This is God's word to us. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores, and all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are they not written in the books, a book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Beloved in Christ, there's not uh, much to this passage, is there? Not much left, period, in the book of Esther. We've come all this way, and this last very brief chapter, like an old light bulb, flickers a few times, and then it dies, and it's out. Story began like the month of March, as they say, coming in like a lion, a queen deposed, beauty treatments, beauty contests, assassination conspiracies, plots to destroy a nation, banquets, gallows raised and used, a new plot to fight back, the deaths of 75,811 enemies, holiday scheduling and celebrations, nine wild chapters, and then the last three verses, the story simply goes out like a lamb, quiet, peaceful, normal, average, everyday ending. It's like the epilogue of a book or a TV show. Everything has been resolved. The murderer is thrown in jail. The marriage has been saved. The mystery is solved. And after the commercial break, all that's left are to tell a few jokes among the detectives, give some where are they nows, and cue the closing credits. The story slips quietly away as the back cover is closed. What could these last verses mean? Why are they mentioned at all? Verse 1, King Xerxes levies a tax on the people throughout the empire. Maybe he was running out of money after all those banquets that he and Queen Esther threw. Verse 1 is about a kingdom tax on the people. Verse 2 talks about a book where all the information you ever wanted to know about Persia and Xerxes and Mordecai is written down. Verse 2, that is, gives us the name of a recommended book for further reading. And verse 3, finally, gives us one more reminder of who Mordecai is. He's a Jew. He's second in command. Next to Xerxes, he's Loved and honored by all the Jews because he worked for their well-being. Verse 3 is about a person. A tax, a book, and a person. Now there's a sermon outline for you. Or a sermon title. A tax, a book, and a person went into a... Bu no, that not... What do you make of it? I don't know. Makes a nice outline, but there's not much to say about it. Let's take a different route. In the last three verses, you also see a little bit of a comparison, don't you, between Xerxes and Mordecai. I mean, here we go again. The Jews, like everyone else in the kingdom, are going to be taxed, are going to have to pay tribute to Xerxes, and yet the last verse says that Mordecai worked for the good of the people, spoke up for their welfare. And so you have a bit of a contrast between Xerxes and Mordecai being made here, Xerxes dropping burdens onto the Jews, and Mordecai, in as much as he is able, sprinkling 
blessings on the Jews. Xerxes, the burden bringer. Mordecai, the blessing bringer. Another terrific sermon outline. But maybe this tax really wasn't a burden at all. Maybe they needed a, a new bridge over the Grand River, or at the very least needed to fix the roads. And if that's the case, it wasn't a burden at all that Xerxes was bringing. And so how can you contrast Xerxes and Mordecai? So you can't do much with that in the text either. So let's take another route yet. Let's focus on the tax or the tribute to be paid. What kind of tax was this? Well, maybe the author of Esther wants to show just how much the Jews' situation has changed. That everyone else has to pay the tax, but the Jews don't. It's a nice idea, but it's not in the text. Maybe the author wants us to see how powerful Mordecai was in that he helped extend Xerxes' power over the kingdom by issuing this tax. Again, nice idea, but the text doesn't support it. Here's another one. Maybe the author wants us to catch a sly link to the Joseph story in Genesis. Did that run through your mind ever? Ran through mine. When Joseph instituted a tax after the famine, when he was second in command to Pharaoh, it's nice, but again, Mordecai is not connected with the Persian tax like Joseph was with the Egyptian tax. Let's try one more. Maybe the author wants us to see that those who treat the Jews well will realize some benefit from doing that. And so Xerxes is reaping the benefit for helping the Jews. Again, it's nice, but finally, also again, it's not supported by the text. And Xerxes could have levied this tax whether he helped the Jews or didn't help them. So what's left? Not much. I started the sermon by saying that there's not much left. In the book of Esther, not much left at all. The well is almost dry. Except, let's try scooping one more bucket. Do you think what the author is trying to tell us in this quiet, boring close to the story, do you think he's trying to say that life in the Medo-Persian Empire, where the Jews were living, pretty much now goes on as it did before. That life in Persia for the Jews, even after this great deliverance, just sort of went back to the way it was. I think that's what's happening. I think that's one of the reasons that God's name isn't mentioned in the book at all, to show us that before this story, the Jewish people were lacking in their depth of understanding and relationship to God. And during the story, the Jewish people were lacking in their depth of understanding and relationship to God. And now even after the story, the Jewish people were lacking in their depth of understanding and relationship to God. I think maybe that's what we're supposed to see. No mention of God. And surely God is the one who worked behind the scenes, saving his people from Haman and certain death. But no mention of God. No celebration of him in their new two-day feast of Purim. No thankful living, no spiritual transformation, no growth and maturity in their walk with God, no spiritual revival, no tent meetings with fiery preachers and prophets and shaking and quaking, no credit given to God for their rescue, no credit given to God for those Gentiles who became Jewish converts, just a tip of the hat to Mordecai who worked hard to help the Jews. Life is back to normal. It shouldn't be, but it is. Xerxes does the kind of things kings do, and the people are still in Persia, and they're far from the promised land, and life is back to normal. 
I think that's what we're supposed to see. And I think it's supposed to rub us the wrong way. I think it's supposed to get us to take a look at our own lives and see if life is just back to normal. Same old, same old. The point being, when God rescues you, when God turns your life around, when God saves you from certain death, at the moment that happens, life is not supposed to go on as before. Life is never supposed to go on as before. The Lord Jesus Christ died to save us from eternal punishment. The Lord Jesus Christ rose to bring us eternal life. And beloved, when that happens, when that becomes a reality in our lives, life is not, is never supposed to go on as before. So we need to do some thinking tonight. Some hard, thoughtful, honest work tonight. How will my life, your life, be different? Walking out these doors tonight. How will my life, your life, be different? Getting ready for bed tonight. How will my life, your life, be different? Waking up tomorrow morning. How will my life, your life, be different during these upcoming summer months? How will my life, your life, be different at our jobs tomorrow morning? How will my life, your life, be different in our marriages after tonight? How will my life, your life, be different during the Monday commute tomorrow morning? How will my life, your life, be different as we handle our finances this week? How will my life, your life, be different? Can you think of ways that life will not go on as before? Can you think of ways it will definitely be different? Think hard and honestly. In marriage, at work, in family, in relationship to Christ, in ministry, at church, in deacon or elder work, in Bible reading, in prayer, at the job, in the school, at the store, on the walk, in the car. Because of the saving work of Christ, life is not, is never supposed to go on as before. Because the Holy Spirit of God lives in us, life is not supposed to go on as before. Because the Word of God has transformed our very lives, life is never supposed to go on as before. Here's one old way. Boy, our church, we need to do this and Look over there. We need to be like that bigger church. And look at this, will you? How, how come no one is taking care of that? Life is not supposed to go on as before. Here's the transformed way. Boy, our church, I need to be faithful in it. Look at this. This is an area in our church life that no one's taking care of. Maybe I could do something about that. And boy, look at that section over there. And that needs some work. Maybe I could lend a hand. I have a talent for that. Why do I keep complaining about it and dragging others down? Why don't I just figure out a way, think of a way to offer what I know I can do. And from what the looks of it, it needs doing. I'm going to stop talking about it all day long and jump in and help out and serve and get in the game. Hear the difference? Like Israel in a foreign land, our greatest temptation is to simply fit in. And the problem is when you fit in nice and comfortable like, what happens is we fail to make an impact. Life is not supposed to go on as before. From the looks of it, it seems like Israel is simply waiting for the next big windfall. You know what a windfall is, right? 
A windfall is when, let's say, a big fat inheritance check comes your way. A windfall. Where'd that come from? In the story of Esther, the windfall came in the form of a person named Mordecai. And oh, they celebrated him instead of the God who worked behind him. But Mordecai, if you do something for us, we'll be so happy and honoring of you. And we'll just hold our breath till the next big windfall has come. And in the meantime, life will go on as before. Because transformation, well, that's a little too hard. That's a little too much to ask. We'll wait for the next big windfall. Beloved, for us, the last windfall has come. His name is Jesus Christ. He saved us. He died on the cross for our sins. He brought us forgiveness, and he transformed our lives so that we might make an impact, so that we might serve, so that life might not go on as before. We celebrate him tonight, and he asks every one of us as we walk out those doors, how will you prevent life from going on as before? How are you going to show other believers and the world that Jesus Christ has made a difference in your life. Life is not supposed to go on as before. I want to do something a little different tonight as a physical demonstration of that truth that life is not supposed to go on as before. And this will be an acting out of that truth, a symbol of it. I'm going to ask us that for our closing song and brief prayer after it, that we kneel as a symbol, a visible sign that we're saying on the basis of God's word that life for us will not go on as before. Now, I understand completely there will be those who cannot do that for physical reasons or other reasons. Of course not. And that is just fine. I'm trusting no one's going to look around and tally up who kneeled and who didn't. But whether you kneel or remain seated, let whatever you do tonight, as we close our service in song and as we pray, symbolize to you and to God that your life is not going to go on as before. Let the kneeling symbolize or the, maybe it's just extending your hands. That Jesus Christ has so saved you that in as many areas as you can think of tonight and in the week ahead, you will seek to let God transform every part of your life. Let the kneeling or whatever you display as an alternative, let it symbolize that a true difference will be visible in your life because you are letting God make that difference happen because of what he has done for you. Let the kneeling or the alternative be something different tonight that says, yes, my life has been transformed. And by the strength of the Holy Spirit living in me and by the word of God leading me, I will not let my life go on as before. As if God never did anything for me. As if I'm still listlessly sitting with Israel in Susa waiting to pay the next tax imposed by King Xerxes. Or as if I'm idly sitting on the front porch with my buddies talking about the glory days of Mordecai. Or numbly watching a documentary or a sitcom or a sporting event about that same subject. Let the kneeling tonight or the alternative show that our lives here at Faith Community Church have been transformed by Jesus. And we want, starting today, we want the whole world to see that our lives will not go on as before because of what Jesus has done. And so if it helps, you can move to the carpeted area. And again, if you can't, certainly that is fine. But extend your hands or something. So let's, if we can, move to our knees now, those able to do so, as we sing and close in prayer.